Silent Night Deadly Night 3 brings back the killer from the original film and introduces a blind psychic as his new final girl. There's also a surprising number of actors from David Lynch projects, so let's find out how weird this Christmas sequel gets. Welcome everyone to Screams After Midnight, I am Pierre and joining me as always is Tim. Happy New Year. <laughs> it's a bit early Tim, we're on Christmas season. We're here yet again for the third year in a row to come back to the Silent Night Deadly Night franchise. Yeah. We're beyond the first two, which are the two that everyone usually talks about. We're into part three and you know, it's uh, our first Christmas episode of the year. Uh, Tim's sick, so <laughs> brace yourself for sick Tim throughout the episode. We're going to try and cheer everyone up, uh, and maybe Tim as well in the process. Uh, talking about <laughs> Silent Night, Deadly Night 3, Better Watch Out, which came out in 1989, and it was a straight-to-video movie. And, you know, there's a 3, a 4, and a 5, which I had never seen, so this was a first-time watch for me. Although, Tim, I think you have seen at least 3 and 4, right? Yeah, I've seen all of them. Okay. Uh, I have a, a DVD that has... <clears throat> actually, I have two DVDs. One uh, that has the first two combined together, and then one that uh, has three, four, and five combined together. So I think I got it about a year or, or two years ago, and I um, actually watched them like all uh, together. I, I'm pretty sure it was last year. So yeah. I'm a d devotee of the, <laughs> the SNDN <laughs> franchise. The SNDN Cinematic Universe. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I uh, I haven't seen I guess te technically there's like a remake or something I, yeah. from a few years ago I haven't seen. That's I think it, it may just be called Silent Night. I'm not sure though. Yeah. But yeah, I think, yeah, I think there was a remake. Which, you know, that's that's a question for us in like three years. You know, when we're done with uh, five. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we could think yeah. about the remake. But uh, I am... Um, Obviously, we'll start spoiler free. Actually, just to mention that, and we'll we'll give you a warning before we get spoilers. Uh, first thing that I want to say about this movie is the fact that there's like three David Lynch actors in this, like oh. alumni from various things. Uh, yeah. So you've got um, what was his name in Twin Peaks? Bobby from Twin Peaks is like the main character's brother. His girlfriend yeah. is Laura Herring from Mulholland Drive. And then the doctor in the film is uh, Richard Horn from Twin Peaks. So this was weird. <laughs> like, why is there so many David Lynch <laughs> project actors in this? And obviously, you know, at least one of them was like much later, uh, you know, a good decade later. But uh, oh, would you say this movie is Lynchian? No, there's one or two moments that almost veer <laughs> into Lynchian. I'm not going to lie. But for the most part, I would say no. For the most part, I would say no. Uh, the, the, there's a lot going on here. There's uh, some weird directions to take the Silent <laughs> Deadly Night franchise that this movie uh, decides to go down, uh, which I'll, I'll get into in a, in a wee second. But um, yeah, so uh, I wasn't sure what to expect in it. This, to be honest, like I, I like you know, I, they're so culturally speaking, they're so disconnected from the first two, the rest of the sequels mm -hmm. that I'm just like. Oh, am I expecting? Am I just expecting like cheap crap and like the not good crap, just crap that no one ever talks about? Or am I expecting mm. uh, just I don't know something else that was made, but then they slapped the title onto it, which is definitely not is because this does tie into the first film. There is mm -hmm. a connective tissue to it, so it, it definitely was made as the sequel that it is. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah. Uh, so the basic premise of this one is that a doctor is using a blind girl who might be a psychic to try and reach the brain of the killer from the first movie who's actually still alive, just in a coma. And <laughs> she kind of sees into his mind and then he wakes up and it's Christmas again and killings happen. That's 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 you. <laughs> it's so funny to describe it as the basic premise because there's nothing basic no. <laughs> about that premise. <laughs> I have so many thoughts about the premise, but uh, before we get into all that, I'll just ask the simple question. Tim, how do you feel yeah. about Silent Night, Deadly Night 3? Uh, I, I think it's a bit of a mixed bag. Uh, so I absolutely love how like crazy the premise gets with this one. Um, you know, to the point where it, it, it's, it is kind of surprising that people mostly only talk about the first two because this, you know, the first 
whatever 10 15 minutes of this is so bonkers that it's like oh my god like i i'm so excited for this uh this thrill ride like it's such a um an unexpected way for the series to go like okay we're talking psychics uh and you know weird mental links uh, be between the killers and this blind girl um it's very interesting and fascinating um my only issue is that it does i think really slow down in the middle uh you know which is very unfortunate like uh it's not like there's um you know not necessarily like some good stuff there but um i i just find it to be a a bit of a slog for a stretch uh in the middle and then uh, the ending kind of picks up a little bit um <clears throat> but yeah it's uh it, i don't think it really lives up to uh how exciting the beginning and that premise uh is um you know i i wish it was a little bloodier i wish the the kills like were a little better uh i think if you had maybe some of that going on it could have kind of saved that that middle stretch um but yeah unfortunately um yeah it just kind of leaves me wanting more but i mean uh, you know th there's something to say though about uh you know at, at least having that that opening and uh stretch you know just being really exciting and <laughs> you know uh getting really amped up for what's gonna happen so <laughs> it's i i i would say i'm a lot more positive with this than mm -hmm. i was expecting i was expecting just like oh this was bad it was but you know i was expecting mm -hmm. like a not necessarily a hellraiser sequel caliber of, of quality oh, sure. but, but something mm -hmm. that was just kind of really nothing and I have to say, it did have at least some things going on that made me go, oh, okay, sure. there's, there's some weirdness yeah. to this. They're making some wacky choices. And it's funny, because I think the, the kills problem is, yeah, the kills aren't really up to much. Uh, it it kind of focuses more on the aftermath of the kills than it does the actual, you know, mm -hmm. kills themselves. Mm -hmm. But I will say, there is, like, I, I think it's largely maybe down to budget that they don't have more impressive kills, and maybe also just kind of, like, you know, that straight to video directing. But at the same time, there is like a couple of moments where there's just the little moments of direction here or there. It's just like, mm. ah, this feels like the person making this, uh, was Monty Hellman. Like, it feels like Monty <laughs> Hellman actually was trying to like, create some sort of, you know, mood or like surreal atmosphere with like how this mm. one little moment here shot or one little moment there. There's kind of a weirdness to it. I appreciate it. It does really slow down. I agree. Uh, you know, to the point where like, I realized I was only like 15 minutes from the end and I'm like, wait, there's only 15 minutes left. It doesn't feel like it's ramped up enough to like be close to the ending. But, um, yeah. but you know, the opening 20, maybe even 30 minutes, depending, uh, is a mix of crazy premise, some really weird character <laughs> lines of dialogue, which when we get into spoilers, I've, I've, I've got a few lines from early on in the film that I really want to bring up. Mm. <laughs> um, and it's got like a bizarrely interesting cast for a film that I was not expecting to recognize anyone. Uh, on top of the three David Lynch actors, there's no one else that I like recognize or know from anything. But uh, the cop that's in the movie, like I was getting like this weird like, are you like, uh, oh, what's his name, uh, Robert Redford? Are you like Robert Redford's like brother or something? Because you sound and look <laughs> a lot like Robert Redford. It's kind of weird, mm. you know. That's got Robert Redford. We got that's that's who we've got in here. Um, but. Yeah, so it's a, it's a, I think it's an interesting enough movie, and there's enough well things that I, I don't think anyone who watches a lot of bad horror sequels is going to feel mad about watching this. I think there's enough okay, here definitely. that I think, I think it's worth watching as the third Silent Night Deadly, just to see where it, they've taken it. <laughs> but oh, absolutely, just don't expect gold. Don't expect you know much from it. And you know, uh, one thing that would really like probably bump it up a whole other point for me. Mm-hmm is like just put him in the freaking santa suit <laughs> like I, I i don't know why <laughs> you know the the these sequels seem to like just not want to have a killer santa <laughs> anymore you know, I, I completely get it i will say though mm -hmm. i do kind of love how absurd his look is like his head oh well, the head uh, yeah that i that's what I, what I was thinking is like you know give him a santa suit but maybe not the hat because yeah, yeah the head is like it's iconic <laughs> yeah <laughs> that, the head he's got does uh it's kind of like uh it, it's almost like he's he's they've cut open the top of his head and he's got now like a dome where you can see his brain yeah. through it and there's like as the movie goes on there's like red blood filling up the dome so yeah. it, it looks like it's got a red tint as the movie goes on but he looks kind of like it, i don't know like a frankenstein creation or something with this dome thing in his head 
isn't there like a DC villain like that, like Cy Simon or something? Yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah, Simon kind of <laughs> looks like this. Yeah. Um. So, I don't know. Uh, I feel like the actor who plays Ricky, because it's Ricky from the first movie. It's you know, it's the killer Santa from the first <laughs> movie, uh, who's back and he's the coma uh, <laughs> patient who gets back up and starts killing people. Uh, Bill Mosley plays him, and I feel like he's in. Oh, yeah. yeah, he's in like some Rob Zombie movies. He's in the Night of the Living Dead remake. He's, he's in the Halloween remake. Is so. it, uh, is is he is he from uh what, what do you call it uh texas chainsaw massacre 2 is that bill bill mosley oh that's uh, let me scroll down that's all the way in the eight. <laughs> um you're right yeah that was his second yeah. credit <laughs> it's texas nice. chainsaw massacre 2. <laughs> oh wait, he's yeah, in that well, he's got a tiny role in the 88 version of the blob he's listed as soldier 2. <laughs> he's horror royalty uh, as far as i'm concerned oh he's an army of darkness Oh, I wouldn't even guess that. Yeah, hi, what is he in that? Let me go. Dead Eight Captain. So obviously that's why you didn't recognize him, <laughs> but he's he's the captain of the Dead Eights. Wow. So that's something. <laughs> <laughs> done, done a lot of uh, low scale horror, but by the looks of it, uh, with a few higher profile things. <laughs> uh, so yeah, even, even that's kind of interesting casting in hindsight, you know. Um, mm. So yeah, a lot of uh, a lot of interesting little details in this. Uh, even even if it's not the best movie, really. But you know, the, like I think <laughs> you can tell that it was shot quickly without a lot of takes for some scenes because there's definitely moments where mm. either the acting and the reaction to something is so off and feels like a video a directed video movie, or the way that like someone moves, or the, especially the killer. There's a few scenes where the killer's like stalking someone, and they're definitely going for this kind of like he's kind of like robotic because he's like not all there. Mm. But there's definitely a couple of moments where it kind of felt like that looked a bit like it's like I know you wanted another take of that to get to get it right, <laughs> but it just feels yeah. kind of sloppy because you probably had you know enough time for two takes ever, and that was it. That's all you ever mm. did. Yeah. Uh, so, um, but so it definitely has that cheap quality to it. Um, but I mean, it looks you know it is shot on film at least like low budget movies back then still aware so at least it, it has that look to it i mean uh, presumably though it's like you know I, I feel like on par with like you know the quality of the silent night deadly night 2 like you know if, if you watch that and you're okay with that i'm sure you'll be okay with this one yeah although that was shot in widescreen at least of course how could i forget <laughs> time come on tell me you noticed this is in four by three uh sure <laughs> you didn't notice black bars at the sides of your tv uh, they're, 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 i don't well i'm too engrossed in the, the film to notice <laughs> these bars you're talking about you're too sure. engrossed in the opening of yeah. silent night deadline 83 you just notice <laughs> at the start that it's uh, a different shape of the image okay all mm -hmm. right whatever I was, I was watching the dvd i don't know if it's they might have had to crop it for that or <laughs> who knows they, they they're supposed to release these on a, a blu-ray um uh i don't know if it's already out or coming out soon but uh who knows maybe that would be 4hx uh you know ultimate widescreen capability or something 4hx <laughs> <laughs> if anyone's wondering what the hell Tim's talking about don't worry so am I so am I um, no I uh, like yeah I mean it's, it's full frame that's obviously how it was shot for the video release back in the day and that's why it's not uh... sometimes you'll find with these types of movies that they, they were shot on widescreen anyway and just cropped for the video um, I don't know if that was them thinking ahead or if it's just a simple case of ah this is the most common type of film you have so we'll just shoot it that way so eventually they get like widescreen releases anyway but obviously some yeah. were just shot in 4x3 and that's what this is so uh, I, I assume 5 might be the same I don't know because I, th I think they're the same or 4, four and 5 I mean because uh, I think they're all the same sort of like because cause, 4 is like the the following year and I think 5 is like mm -hmm. quite quickly after that as well so alright Tim's nodding because he's bored of <laughs> everything I'm talking about alright well I tell you, just wait till 4 <laughs> 4 is uh something else <laughs> <laughs> oh I, I can't wait for next year tim i'm sure it'll be a blast yeah and that one is uh that one is by uh brian usner surprisingly oh. which uh so someone of note <laughs> speaking of horror royalty 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah. Uh, I don't know if there's much more to say without going into spoilers, to be honest. Like, <laughs> it's, you know, it's got some ropey acting at points. And sometimes it's like, I know some of these actors can do better. And then some of them I'm like, yeah, Bobby from Twin Peaks was about this good in Twin Peaks too. It, it just, it, David Lynch is good at fitting mediocre actors into his work and it feeling <laughs> like it fits somehow. He's, he knows how to do surreal in a, a weird way. Mm-hmm. So I'll say that much. But uh, yes, uh, so... I guess spoilers for Silent Night Deadly mm. Night Part Three, and we'll 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 get into it. Um, Let's do it. The movie opens with uh, a dream sequence, which is because we have our lead character Laura hooked up to mm. dream equipment or whatever, and but she's actually psychically trying <laughs> to link up with the killer from the first movie. Although it doesn't seem like the doctors like told her that's what she's doing. It feels like he's mm. manipulating her and like out for, you know because the, doc- the doctor character from, uh, Richard Horn from Twin Peaks uh, he is you know he's maniacal he's can he, you know conniving he, he pretends to be nice and all that but he's like he's trying to get into the mind of a serial killer <laughs> so yeah. you know uh, very skeevy in a lot of ways and he's using this blind girl who might be psychic to, to do it mm. um, it, it seems very inconvenienced that she's going on mm. break for Christmas that she's going to her grandmother's oh well, you'll come back <laughs> after the Christmas holidays and we'll continue our work, our very important work. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I love uh, this opening shot. It is, like, so, I guess, like, yeah, like, weird and, and surreal and, uh, like, um, you know, I, 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 again, it just kind of throws you in, into the deep end, like, what like what the hell is going on with, with this movie? Um, but th- there is kind of, like, a, a dreaminess to it that, I don't know, works for me. And, you know, uh, this is a good example of, like, where, you know, uh, a, a dream sequence is really, like, you know, uh, actually, like, works in the movie and doesn't feel, like, you know, cheap or anything. It's actually pretty good. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's important to the plot, obviously, that, that, that you know, mm-hmm. w- what's trying to happen here. So it makes sense. And it kind of, you know, it's, it's the, just this sort of, like, she's looking at, like, the, the comatose like, guy on the table, which, you know, which turns out to be Ricky the Killer, who, like, lifts up a blade and she gets scared and runs away, but she ends up riding around a corner and then is met with, like, a Santa Claus who's sitting there. Mm-hmm. And then, even though, obviously, our main character, Laura, is, like, you know, 22 or whatever she is, she, like, st- immediately sits in Santa's lap and says, Santa, I want this for Christmas, and I want this for Christmas. Mm-hmm. Uh, actor playing Santa here is obviously having the time of his life. Uh, and then, <laughs> you know, lifts up the same blade and goes to kill her, and that's when she wakes up out of the dream. And it's like, mm-hmm. okay, all right, so we're actually kind of tying into the past films. And then they fly out saying, no, this is Ricky from the first movie. This is them mm-hmm. trying to connect to his brain. And I love that occasionally she also gets, like, glimpses of his past, which means, yet again, <laughs> we have flashbacks <laughs> to the first movie. <laughs> it's not as much yeah, this time, obviously, but still, mm-hmm. it happened a few times. Yeah, <laughs> lest you forget. <laughs> yeah, so if people have forgotten part two, the mm. first half of the film is almost entirely just mm. scenes from the first film. Uh, here it's more just snippets and little bits and pieces uh, to, to provoke her memory. But mm. I, I wouldn't have thought twice about it if it wasn't for the fact that the second movie notoriously is like half of right. the, you know, half of it's the first movie again. Yeah. So, uh, but yeah. But there's, yeah, so there's some wacky lines uh, early on in the film here that really. Uh, stuck out to me so after laura leaves and she goes to the reception i've got some thoughts on that actually as well uh but she uh, the doctor is like nah don't worry don't worry nurse Sh- she'll be back and this is this was the, this is the exact word he used then she'll let me go as deep as i want <laughs> and she she likes it she loves it <laughs> She's got a thirst for knowledge. She's going to penetrate his mind in ways that we can only imagine. And I'm like, what pervert is writing this dialogue? <laughs> <laughs> it's just full of, like, in-your-face innuendo the entire time. Oh, it's horny as hell. Yeah, yeah I'm all, hell, even Laura's... I mean, Laura, the brother, her brother eventually picks her up, which is Bobby from Twin Peaks. Though, like, she gets in the car with them, and she she immediately goes, "Hey, how does P Brain uh, get off his bell or something, something like that?" It was some stupid joke, mm-hmm. and she starts like jerking the uh, like the the belt, like the little mm-hmm. you know the the buckle, you know the the thing. The, the, mm-hmm. What would you call it specifically the bit the, the 
<laughs> the seat belt? The... No, no, no. Like on, on a belt, mm. right? On a like on, on a belt, right? On a on a belt. Oh, like the latch or yeah, like like. So obviously you've got the buckle, yes. but I'm specifically yeah. talking about the actual little bit that goes in the hole, right? Mm -hmm. uh, she starts like sort of doing. It's like a miniature jack off thing she starts doing with it, mm. and it's maybe this dumb joke, and I'm like. What was this joke? That was not funny. That was that was terrible. What are you doing? But it was so bad that I kind of enjoyed that you tried to make it work. Uh, this this entire segment's uh, kind of weird, actually. Uh, it turns I mean, it turns out some of it's a dream. But like when Laura comes out to the reception, she goes up to the receptionist and says, "My brother's coming to pick me up. Could you let me know when he's here?" Because she's blind, obviously. And this receptionist is like, "Well, honey, I'm." very busy like <laughs> it's a blind woman what are you <laughs> right yeah and, but all, and then equally like i it, like before she even starts walking away laura under her breath just goes what a bitch, bitch. and <laughs> the receptionist is like excuse me and i was like yeah laura you're blind but she's not deaf like, <laughs> like yeah. you're still standing right in front of her what are you doing? <laughs> um which and then all this was weird it's like surely her brother knowing that his sister's blind wouldn't just expect her to know when he's mysterious or you know miraculously arrived outside oh, sure, the building yeah. like <laughs> and sure enough to be fair when later on when she's fallen asleep and he comes in and gets her like yeah obviously he comes in because his sister's blind why wouldn't he come in and get her she's not going to somehow just know that he's there it would, mm. but yeah so you know some some weird little things like that um <laughs> but you uh you've got that and she also has a, a dream sequence which is actually also kind of like a like a vision of the future here mm. Where she like you know walks basically no one's around anymore and it sort of plays it like everyone's left and she's asking the receptionist like for the time and the receptionist isn't responding and then she like walks around and it kind of plays it like whenever she gets one of these visions in her head it's almost like she's still blind but then when she sees a dead body it's like she's actually seen it somehow because she's seeing like what the killer's going to see. Uh, so she sees like the the receptionist throw it slit. I actually this is as far as like the bloody stuff goes. This is probably the best bit of the movie, just because mm -hmm. it's a good visual with the throat slit and there's like blood squirting out. But then like Laura immediately like you know she touches her to see what's happened, feels the the wound or whatever, and immediately puts her hand on her face. So she actually kind of inadvertently smears blood all down her face and she starts screaming yeah. before she wakes up. I thought it actually looked quite good, just as like a a visual thing. Yeah, it's not bad. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> I don't know, what do you what do you think of the uh the brother sister dynamic that is introduced here uh i i like the brother i thought he was a fun character uh he has a, a great uh head of hair i i'm just instantly uh engulfed in that that long <laughs> tangles and curls uh blonde just... curly hair yeah which actually was why yeah. i didn't recognize him because it's like so different from what it looks like in twin peaks yeah, I, I never would have put that together that <laughs> those two are are the same people, um, but yeah, no, I I think they're fun. They uh, you know, they play off each other well. Yeah, um, and what's funny is that so he introduces his new girlfriend, which this you know Laura keeps making fun of even before she meets her, um, but immediately there's this kind of hostile attitude, and mm -hmm. my first thought was so Laura Herring plays the girlfriend, who obviously is a bit more well known in, in hindsight, but. I did think that both her and the girl, the actress playing Laura, uh, Laura looked very, very similar. And like the oh, first, yeah, yeah. the first scene they were looking at each other, I'm like, like how are you not supposed to be related? Like in this movie, because because you, <laughs> you look so, so you've both got dark hair, you have very mm. similar features. Um, if if anything, I'm almost convinced that because Laura's hair is down for the first part of the movie, and then once she meets the girlfriend character, mm. she starts wearing her hair up, and I'm almost convinced that that wasn't planned. They just realized, mm. oh shit, we're going to have to do something different with her hair. To make sure it's clear at all times which one is which, because yeah. you could very easily be mistaken. Uh, but uh, yeah, one of the first things she says to her is uh, it's like, "Oh, hey," she's like, "Hey, Laura, your your brother Chris has told me so much about you," and she's like, "Yeah, Chris has told me you give good head." <laughs> I'm like, "What is this hostile attitude?" <laughs> She could probably have been a little nicer <laughs> to the girlfriend. Um, and the, the the next line I had written down between the two of them was uh, like they get in the car and just casually, uh, the girlfriend turns around and says, "So Laura, how long have you been handicapped?" I'm like, "Who's who asked that?" <laughs> or, well, at least how would you phrase it like that? You wouldn't phrase it like that, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, just really, and maybe you could say that she's being like spiteful in return because of the. 
the given head comment. Maybe, maybe she's like fighting fire with fire or something, but uh, I don't know. Was yeah, I, was, you know, I, I was getting ready for a cat fight. I was like, meow. <laughs> <laughs> Bring it on. You kind of feel bad for the girlfriend because no matter what, she's going to look bad. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like, if she's picking a fight with the blind girl, she's, she's going to look bad. Like, it's just, you know. It's uh, tough, yeah. How do you win against that? <laughs> you, you, yeah, you, you just you can't. Um, yeah, uh, that's. I mean, that's face. This is a precursor to "Don't Breathe." This is like, this, this. this <laughs> Laura is the the mother, even though Stephen Lang's like really old and he'd be born way before this. Like, he, she's the mother uh, of the character in "Don't Breathe." That's my my gut instinct. So, wait, you think only like blind people give birth to blind people? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm saying that they are related because she's clearly trained him in the ways of fighting like like serial killers in the I dark. Gotcha. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> I was go- I was going more now. Like he's taught, she taught him his skill set is what I was going for. <laughs> That's fair. Yeah. <laughs> oh dear. Um, yeah. Also, I've got I have glossed over. There's a scene at the hospital where there's like a Santa who was there, like doing Christmassy things. Oh, this I guess. is important. Yeah. Oh, this is super important. Well, I mean, this is this is when uh Ricky gets up, I suppose. So it is very important. Right, but- yeah. Uh, no, I, I wasn't being sarcastic. It uh, was an important scene. <laughs> yeah, but the part the part I remember the most though is Santa walking past like a I I, I assume an attract. I don't think we even get a good look at her, but he he obviously thinks this nurse is attractive, and he turns around and just mutters under his breath, "Hey, would you like to lick my candy cane, sweet girl?" <laughs> like I was like, ah, oh. why is everyone well, in these yeah. movies like a complete like sex fiend? Like, <laughs> hey. You gotta give them points for trying, you know what I mean? <laughs> if it works, hey. <laughs> uh, and then he goes into where Ricky is and starts, like, drinking booze and making fun of the comatose patient. Uh, so, mm. he kind of has it coming when Ricky gets up and stabs him, I suppose. Oh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> there's... Yeah, there's, there's really no reason for him to do any of this. <laughs> yeah, for the, most, uh, for the most part, the kills are just kind of, like, people, like, screaming mm. as Ricky's coming towards them, and then you'll see their mm. body layer. You know, you don't tend to get, like, the actual penetration to use the uh, doctor's word for mel now do you think the reason that he like gets up out of his coma is like a combination of this kind of like spark of, of brain activity from his mental link with uh laura and then also like the just you know being taunted by santa claus yet again because i mean that's such a big part of like his life in the first movie just constantly like getting into situations where you know, he's being bullied or taunted or, like, harassed by Santas. Yeah, because I think the... Because uh, I think Laura's, like, seeing the flashbacks of his origin around mm-hmm. this time, and then the Santa's taunting him as he's lying on the table. I think later on the doctor says that red triggers his memories, and I'm like, no, it's a bit more specific than red, <laughs> buddy. It's, like, very specific yeah. what taunts his memories. Uh, so, yeah, uh, I think that's just about... I, I think, like being connected to her has kind of like brought him back to life in some capacity you know it's given him yeah. enough more skills to get up and start killing people like a zombie yeah so this would be like a perfect like you know way to just have him like you know take out this you know uh hospital santa and then just put on the costume like it's like it's literally right there like why why are we not giving the people what they want? I also thought he was going to put on the costume just because it was a disguise to walk out the, the hospital without anyone, right? Yeah, you know, <laughs> asking them a question. Obviously, he's going to kill the receptionist, but uh, then he he like hitchhikes down like <laughs> the, the LA one hundred and one in like a hospital gown. He does, and some crazy bastard <laughs> lets him in his car, even though he's literally got like a dome, and you can see his brain through the glass. Yeah, <laughs> yeah like unless you think he's like. You know, going to Comic Con cosplaying as, <laughs> as a Simon from DC. Like, yeah, all right, what are you doing? Yeah. And uh, last I checked, Simon doesn't typically wear a hospital gown, just uh, for the No, record. no. <laughs> Not usually. No. I mean, I'm sure there's maybe one issue somewhere where he was in a hospital gown for some reason, but it's the, the not, oh, yeah. not his iconic look, I would say. Uh, so, like. The setup is like fine, and I was like, up until this point, like I actually was relatively pretty entertained. But I mean, this wasn't good per se, but I was relatively entertained by everything. Uh, there's even like a bit after this where there's like a it's a guy that works like a like a you know a, a, like a a garage or something, yeah, something like that. Mm-hmm. 
and he's like working on his own and he's it's this classic kind of he's on his own doing the night shift and there's like this this, this scene was really weird to me it was a good, a good like kind of a good microcosm of the film as a whole because i thought it equally had some of the silliest like just like we want to have like more sex talk for the sake of sex talk but also <laughs> at the same time had one of the best artistic little moments of the whole film so this mm. guy's like just this is one shot of him sitting there watching tv some old movie on tv and the phone rings and he picks it up and he's like it's blah 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 you know tires and co whatever uh <laughs> and it turns out it's his girlfriend or wife or whatever and he's just sort of saying oh hi i'm happy here for you i'm just working on my own i'm watching a movie blah and he says hey i want you to talk to me dirty like you did the other night but he doesn't say it in a skeevy way he says it in kind of like a, hey could you talk to me dirty like you did the other night like that was really cool i, I enjoyed that um and then the car uh with you know uh, ricky the killer pulls up and he goes outside and he, he and I, th- I thought he was gonna get a santa hat here because he because because the guy like w- w- made the point of coming back and getting his santa hat before he went and talked to him but yeah. when he, he goes to speak to ricky and it cuts back to his desk and it's just like the phone's just sitting off the hook on the mm. table and the camera just kind of slowly tracks into it and you hear the movie a little bit and you then you start to hear the voice of the girlfriend on the phone who's just saying things like come on baby i want to talk dirty <laughs> to you and it just kind of feels like yeah this movie's really horny for some reason but at the same time mm. the way it was just sort of slowly tracking in the phone to her like wondering where he is and trying to like be playful as we know he's being killed i thought you know what there's a little bit of uh there's a little bit of art artistry going on here you know yeah you're just because like you know you're making like a you know just straight to video horror sequel doesn't mean you can't you know have little flourishes here and there yeah that's kind of what i felt i felt like it was you know someone had an idea for a little moment and if they can't do the gore then you might as well make it feel like creepy or something and this actually was very mildly i you know in terms of effectiveness but i felt like it was going for something as a moment so you know have a point movie have a point have a christmas point um so yeah uh so another note i've got down here so so they're on their way to their grandmother's house right uh Mm -hmm. and somehow i don't know how but ricky beats them there despite the fact that they left hours before he (laughs) (laughs) a little weird i I know they stop at a store at one point to buy some stuff but like (laughs) they weren't you know it was like it was like a small store they picked up a few things so you know it wasn't, it wasn't much. And, and, like, unless all the stuff with Ricky happens, like, immediately after they leave, and, you know, it's only, like, <laughs> like five, ten minutes or something, like, but, yeah, that's un- kind of unbelievable. <laughs> yeah, but it doesn't feel, it feels like the end of the night, though. It feels like everyone's going home and the hospital's half empty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what it feels yeah. like. So, <laughs> it feels like time has went on a bit. Um Oh, to be fair, I think the doctor did say to Laura it was it was it was kind of later than expected when they finished, you know, their their mm-hmm. session at the start. Uh, oh, and and to be fair, she does go for a therapy appointment before they oh, leave that's true. I forgot about to go that, to the grandmother's yeah. house, uh, which I completely forgotten about until I just m- mentioned it there. Uh, yeah. uh, I don't know if there's much to say, but I mean, the doctor has some dramatic turns at a couple of points where he's like in his chair and he swivels around and he's talking all <laughs> about you know. People believe that the, you know animals can communicate with each other you know, telepathically, <laughs> and so when you say you might be psychic, I can believe you, my dear. I can believe you. Um, I, I guess what they were trying to do with this is like give giving her this trauma where she like also saw her parents die in a plane crash, kind of like <laughs> how Ricky saw his parents die on Christmas. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I wouldn't say they oh, do yeah. anything with it <laughs> as the movie goes on. <laughs> there is a link there <laughs> that's a very tenuous one i admit mm. but some uh, mm. uh but uh we get introduced well, whilst he's on the way there and they found the dead boys at the hospital we get introduced to our detective discount robert redford um mm. who teams up with benjamin horn uh to go after ricky and he seems like a fairly reasonable character in the sense that he's like you know, maybe you shouldn't have kept the serial killer alive. Maybe that was a bad idea. Maybe reanimating his brain was also a bad idea because now innocent people are dying. He seemed like a fairly sensible character that was making sense and, you know, speaking with the uh, sense of logic. 
until there's just this random scene when they're in the car and he spends like two minutes trying to sell him a car phone <laughs> i don't understand <laughs> why <laughs> he turns to the doctor and he's like hey have you got one of these car phones well i don't know how i could live without it it's got all these features you know like <laughs> it's so weird well you gotta figure though uh around that time you know cell phones weren't really a thing so <laughs> what that's your justification <laughs> like the doctor says wait you, do you get a cut out of selling these like phones or something because like why are you selling me this so hard and i kind of felt that way about the movie i'm like did, did the movie have some sort of deal with like so, a car phone company <laughs> And then, like, the director just got their first one and was really excited to talk about it. Maybe they, yeah, maybe the director's just passionate about car phones. Maybe that's what it is. <laughs> maybe, maybe that's his forte. He loves... Mm. Maybe that's why he took the job of directing the movie. Why did he pay for his new car phone? <laughs> 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 anyway, uh, so... They're kind of, and effectively, the the cop at one point gets out for a piss and, like, the doctor just steals his car so he can get to the killer on his own. Um, Joe, Joe, Joe is weird about this movie is if you take out the telepathic thing mm. although arguably one of them kind of has that but if you take out the telepathic thing I would say this feels a lot like a bad Halloween sequel and that you've got oh, sure. yeah. you know, comatose killer getting back up and like going after mm. the person that he's connected to you know you could compare that to a lot of Halloween sequels where he's going after a family member or something and he's like he's, he's, mm. he's gunning for them you've got this cop and like the doctor admittedly is more pro-killer than anti-killer like Donald Pleasance was but you know, there's definitely a lot of parallels well, the, to Halloween sequel. Yeah, I mean, the the Doctor actually reminds me of Doctor Sartain from uh, the 2018 Halloween a little bit. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah, because he's kind of like, no, don't let my science experiment die. Like, we have yeah. to save him so that I can keep <laughs> messing with his brain and unlock the secret to humanity. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The I'm still not like entirely sure exactly what his experiment is. Like, what he what he's trying to achieve, like. Yeah, exactly. What secrets are you you hoping to learn from this, like, psycho Santa? I think there's one line of dialogue when he's arguing this with the, the cop, where he says something mm -hmm. like, looking into his brain will help us stop other people from becoming serial killers. There was something to that effect, which <laughs> I can't, I mean, I get the logic of, kind of, but I'm not so sure you're, like... <sighs> this is not the best example for that, because... <laughs> Yeah, ba basically all you're going to learn is like, oh, uh, let's not, like, to prevent future Santa serial killers, like, just not have, like, kids be completely traumatized by Santa <laughs> their whole life. Like, well, no, no. Yeah, don't... If you remember back to the first film, I would argue it's not so much that, it's to not have every single, like, adult and authority figure in their life after that, but intentionally try and provoke the traumatic memory right, of yeah. what happened to his parents. <laughs> yes. Because <laughs> that's what happened in that first movie. Let's that's not, that's not sell that short. Um, so, I don't know. And, and maybe... Yeah, it's kind of a shame they didn't play more with, like... I don't know. Maybe, maybe like, if you, if you sell this idea that Laura really loves Christmas, so the idea that she's connected to him psychically means that he keeps seeing, like, visions of Christmas in her head, and maybe that's what, like, makes him, like, snap this time. Yeah, I mean, I think that's another, you know, big detriment to the movie is, you know, there's really not much of a Christmassy feel to it. Like, uh, you know, it takes place in L.A., so, like, you know, hey, uh, you know, as Randy Newman said, uh, I, I love L.A., but, you know, it's, you know, not, it's not, like, any snow or anything to give it any type of, like, Christmassy vibe or whatever. Like, nah, I, I mean, guess, aside from maybe, like, Granny's house has, like, yellow trees and presents and stuff, so I guess it's that, but... And there's a Santa early on, and they talk about yeah. going away for the holidays and stuff. And that said, though, I will say the lights outside of Granny's house felt like mm -hmm. the budget was... Like, how much money have we got left for Christmas lights for this house? Oh, we got about $10. <laughs> all right, get what you can get and put yeah. it around the, the porch. And that's all it is, is, is these lights. I think, uh, you know, to be fair, though, like, we we wanted to, like, decorate our house this year. And, like, you know, we got, like, excited. and like, oh, like, let's get a bunch of lights and we'll go all over the roof. And then once you actually go to, like, put them up, it's like, uh, I, I got to get, like, a ladder and I got to find, like, <laughs> extension plugs and, like, you know, all this crap. It's like, it, it's not worth it. <laughs> like, I mean, God bless anyone who, uh, you know, can do all that. But <laughs> we just ended up wrapping it around, like, a little... <laughs> 
like a column in front of our house. Like, yeah, that's good enough. <laughs> a column? You got a monolith out in the, the front garden? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just a 2001 well, monolith? <laughs> yeah. We, we got a lot of Greek... Uh, influenced uh, architecture <laughs> oh, oh architecture Ooh, very yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah so i mean it, it does take place at christmas but it, it does kind of feel like the budget maybe stopped it from like going all out or but again just having him dress up as santa would have been that said though yeah. he arrives at the granny's house because we, we see the granny on the phone to chris at one point when they're <laughs> at the store uh but when the killer arrives at the granny's house she like even though he's mute and doesn't say anything he invites her in and <laughs> feeds him and there's this great shot of him sitting there at the table looking down at the super whatever it is but he's got like a like a you know like a beanie hat over the top of his dome so you see like the metal rim <laughs> at the bottom of his dome and then this hat on top of it which i, I thought was yeah. a really funny visual that yeah hey <laughs> granny don't why, first of all, why did you let a stranger in who's like a, you know, big guy who could be dangerous? You don't know. Like, he, ch- you know, he came up to your door. This, this feels like a, a dodgy... Um, it's a, it's clearly a, a modern reimagining of the classic fairy tale Little Red Riding Hood. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, because in Little Red Riding Hood, the, uh, the wolf was fine until... <laughs> until provoked with the memory of his trauma because basically what makes him snap and kill granny is granny decides to be exceptionally nice like she goes above and beyond in the sake of christmas she's got the christmas spirit and th- flowing through her ancient blood i swear she says you know what Did you see how many oh. presents were under that tree i'm like <laughs> she only has two grandkids like <laughs> but she goes over to the tree and she's like let's see if there's something here for you and i'm like first of all <laughs> Have you just got <laughs> random, like, spare presents wrapped up under the tree in case you have to give them out to orphans or something? Because why is there a spare present that wasn't for someone else? I feel I feel like I've seen that in, like, movies before, though. Like, I don't, yeah. I don't know if that's a thing people used to do in the old days. Like, maybe if, you don't know if you'd have, like, more guests or something. But, yeah, that seems absolutely crazy to me. Yeah. To like, like, oh... <laughs> Here's like a a present, a, a, a very special, expensive, intimate present I got for my <laughs> wife, but uh, I guess I can give it to you, stranger. Yeah, maybe it was meant for Chris, and she's like, you know what, he can have one less, I'll just rip the tag off. Here, yeah. you can have this one. <laughs> um, and if you did buy in a lot of generic gifts for people, just in case you needed extra ones, it's like, okay, but they're not going to be meaningful. It's going to be a bunch of, like, you know, bathroom sets and, like, you know, yeah. all, all, the, the, the most generic <laughs> gifts you get people at Christmas. I mean, you don't really know someone that well. It's like, oh, here's just a, <laughs> you know pack of socks or something here's a subscription to uh the mild fuzz patreon hey <laughs> right, i wish they did gift cards I, I think we could make a killing <laughs> at christmas people could buy all their all their poor friends uh a, a year of mild fuzz <laughs> patreon <laughs> great value tim that's all i'm saying oh i agree great value <laughs> <laughs> see, there's got to be a way to 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 buy a subscription and gift it to someone i think that's that, that'll that be our um uh our mission <laughs> for our patrons i i know you already <laughs> buy for yourself but why, why not <laughs> give someone <laughs> the gift of a subscription honestly g- gifting a sub because it's something you can do on twitch uh you can gift a, mm. a twitch subscription to someone and twitch mm does really well with that so it's kind of weird that patreon is not thought of a way even if it's not like a built-in thing where you like because twitch even lets you do it randomly if you just want to if you want to just like put in a, a, a sub and it'll just randomly select someone is there to give it to uh but even, even just the idea of like being able to like pay for someone else's sub you can't do it on patreon it's weird uh anyway this is a weird budget to go down <laughs> anyway um so what we're getting at is that her offering him a Christmas mm. present because she says the line, "Let's see if Santa's left you anything," and immediately he's triggered. <laughs> he's like, "Kill, murder, death, kill, naughty, naughty, garbage day, punish." I mean, he doesn't say anything. He actually doesn't have a single line in the whole movie until the last mm. weird five seconds, which we'll get to at the end. <laughs> but, <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> he kills Granny. He comes towards her and she screams, mm. and then. You know, that's like halfway or so through the movie, and then there is a lot of down quiet time of like the three of them, you know, the, the Laura, her brother, and the brother's girlfriend at the house, wondering where Granny is, like checking on the food. 
Uh, mm-hmm. We have to get Laura Herring, who, you know, very attractive woman, to take her top off and go into the bathtub. <laughs> uh, in fact, that's a really disturbing scene because then Bobby from Twin Peaks takes his top off and gets in with her. And <laughs> I thought I had a hairy chest. This dude has got a, like, a, a bear fur on his chest. <laughs> I'm not shaming. I'm just saying that, that there was. That I was not prepared for the level of fuzz. Nothing, <laughs> ma- nothing mailed about this fuzz. I'm, I'm just, I'm just saying. Well, you, you can tell. I mean, he was rocking that, uh, you know, those golden curls on, on top of his head. So, yeah, so- you knew he was working with something downstairs. <laughs> he had curly hair all over. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, so we get that disturbing bathtub scene, um, and then just some looking around, asking the neighbors if Granny's around. There's not a whole lot to it. You know, there's a few moments mm. where Laura, like, is complains that, like, a chair's moved a little bit because she knows the house really well. <laughs> or... <laughs> There's something to that effect. This chair it used to be over there. <laughs> How could that be? I mean, it, it's worse than that, though. It's not even like it's moved to this area. It's, it's moved two inches. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 something's wrong. This chair's moved. <laughs> Someone's been through here. And I'm like, don't, don't, don't people just, like, accidentally move their chairs a little mm. bit all the time? You know, unless they fix them once in a while. Like, you know, it's not that weird. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, it's not weird to sit down, but sort of do it too hard that you, the, the chair slips back a little bit or something. And then... <clears throat> um, and do we already know at this point that um, that he's kind of, like, seen through her eyes? Or do we realize that, like, a little later? <laughs> no, they've kind of brought it up, I think, by this point. They're kind of... Mm-hmm. It's kind of slowly sort of tease throughout the movie that they're, they're both kind of seeing through each other's eyes and that's why Which he's kind of like why her, he yeah. yeah i mean that's why he's at you know this house because <laughs> otherwise it'd be like a very huge coincidence oh yeah yeah he's he's tracking her down because he's like sensing her and seeing through her um maybe you could even argue he's trying to commit suicide maybe if he kills her then he'll just drop dead because like his link that's sort of like reanimated him is not there anymore that's kind of a oh wow interesting thought Dark. Uh, yeah. Then again, maybe he's back in the fourth one. I have no idea. <laughs> so, mm. Don't spoil it, Tabby. I'll find out. <laughs> you will find out. <laughs> uh, so eventually, though, he shows up, obviously. Ricky, like, uh, why, why he leaves him alone for so long? Because he was already there and already killed the granny. So why he takes so long to do anything when they're there, I don't know. But eventually, he does come after them. Mm. And he actually does it, like... It's really low energy because he, he puts his arm through the door and grabs Laura Herring, right? And holds her to the door by her neck for a bit until Bobby from Twin Peaks runs in and stabs his arm. And like, that's the entire reaction to this. Like, the actual going through the door, the way he grabs her, and then Bobby's reaction of like holding the, the girlfriend and just being like, oh my God, why did he do that? All of it just feels so weirdly low energy and like poorly acted. Mm. And I kind of help it feel like they just like they had no time to get like a second or third take. It was this was just yeah. we've got one prop door that you can break through. You're, you're doing all of it in one, and whatever we get is what we're using. And it can, it just has that feeling to it. Uh, and for, for, I mean, from here, there's not, I mean, the last chunk of the movie, there's not a whole lot of exciting stuff to talk about. Really, it's uh, you know, he gets a shotgun, but Keller jumps out and kills him, and. We were seeing as he's killing people, it's like the blood's filling up in his dome around his brain. Uh, and then the doctor shows up and gets stabbed. <laughs> you know, immediately. Not much to say there. Uh, no. Laura gets... Uh, say, well, no, sorry, not Laura. Uh, it's because her real name's Laura. Uh, the, uh, the girlfriend, Laura Herring's character. She mm. gets just sort of pulled under a bed and that's how she goes. We don't really see what happens to her. Mm-hmm. And... Where it made me think of Don't Breathe, though, is, uh, so, like, the, you know, their main character is a blind woman sort of going around this house, and when she gets to the basement, she, like, she breaks the light bulb to even the odds. It's like, okay, now we're even. Oh, that's true, yeah. And that's, I'm like, that's, that's yeah. very Don't Breathe, you know, I'm, I'm getting some vibes mm-hmm. of that. Um, so, he comes in, although, I will say that from the, the audience perspective, it doesn't actually look that dark, there's still a lot of light coming <laughs> in from other places so we can see what's going on. We're just meant yeah. to believe he can't see anything now. And it's like, eh, mm-hmm. I don't know. <laughs> I'm making things out pretty clearly, but... Yeah. Whatever you do, movie. Whatever you do. Uh, yes. So, and ultimately, it's just, like, she, hold, she she has, like, a broken mop or something that she holds up and, like, lures him in and stabs him. She wins. <laughs> like, it's... Yeah. It's yeah. Un- unfortunately, like, yeah, very lackluster. Like... That's the sad yeah, part, yeah. is the back half does feel like... Uh, the visual of him going around with his dome head's quite cool and funny yeah but mm-hmm. like the, the actual 
stalking and killing is very just kind of going through the motions and dull and uh, it's just that's a shit. It's just yeah, it's just like a lot of like kind of just lifeless stabbings or just you know stuff where you see him like yeah going for someone and then cutting away uh which i mean yeah obviously they're you know working with like lower budget but i mean you can still think of some like interesting stuff and you know again like you know if you were using like more like christmas christmasy things like you know strangling someone with like tinsel or or whatever like mm. i mean you know the, the stuff like you know you might have done the other movies um maybe you know you know when a uh, copy everything but you know at least to vary it uh, a little bit i don't know or maybe not have him do christmasy things but have her fight back with christmas like, well she's oh sure maybe yeah. throwing like you know christmas tree ornaments at him or something to try and get him to yeah. slow down <laughs> be fun uh, yeah you know just this idea she's fighting him with christmas because christmas is kind of his weakness even though we associate christmas with this killer <laughs> yeah <laughs> um yeah, there's, there's ideas there. Uh, the end of the movie, the, the cop gets there and he's just kind of in awe that she did this. And she's like, I don't know how you did this, sweetheart, but, like, you survived. <laughs> and he gets in the car with her and she just sort of, like, she's staring off. I mean, she's not really staring, she's blind. But you know what I mean? She's uh, just sitting there yeah. looking mm-hmm. off in the distance. And she says, Merry Christmas. Just, just kind of, like, half defeated. Like, she's, you know, mm-hmm. kind of happy she's won, but obviously her brother's dead, her granny's dead. Uh She's probably not uh, crying too many tears for uh, her, the, 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 the girlfriend, though. She didn't really like her very much. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, uh, mm-hmm. And the car drives away. And just before we go to the credits, does this... And this this is like... You know, so the movie, I'm realizing that there's all these David Lynch actors in it. And then the end of the mm-hmm. movie, it just does this really weird little David Lynch thing in the last five seconds. <laughs> it's like... So... On the screen, right? So there's a little moment as they're like loading the bodies into the ambulance and stuff. There's like a little mm-hmm. almost joke where the the paramedics say, "Hey, we might be able to save this guy if, we, if we're lucky." And it's you know they're talking <laughs> they're talking about the killer, and the cop just has this look in his face. He's like, oh, "Like just let him die. Like just let him die." <laughs> but as him and uh, the main character are driving away, uh, and we see the ambulance driving away. So we get this aerial shot looking down at him and then just fading in over the top of it. And it doesn't come in full. Mm-hmm. It sort of just half fades in so you can still see the, the driving underneath. Um, mm-hmm. Is the killer. It's Ricky with his dome head. But for some reason, <laughs> he's wearing a tuxedo. And then he just sort of smiles and for the first time in the movie says something and he says, and a happy new year. <laughs> and then the movie goes to credits. <laughs> uh perfect <laughs> i'm not gonna lie this this like 10 seconds at the end like almost completely saves like the dull last half of this movie because it's just oh, so sure. random yeah. and weird <laughs> it's not quite the end of christmas evil because that i think that was more shocking to me right but this yeah, this yeah. was still pretty like wild there. <laughs> yeah this was just like a really weird it was this like weird comedy beat uh, absurdly like surreal comedy beat with the killer like what does it mean <laughs> Other than just like she said, Merry Christmas, and he's saying, and a Happy New Year. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know. The ending's kind of nuts. Uh, just I mean, when I say the ending, I mean mm. that last 10 seconds. I mean just that last 10 seconds. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then credits. Yeah, like imagine like any other movie doing that, like a Friday the 13th just ending with like, yeah, Jason, <laughs> you know, just like saying something like, all right, see you later. Like, that would be <laughs> insane. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, like, yeah. Jason just fades in at the end, and he's got the mask on. He's like, "Oh, uh, I'll see you next Friday the Thirteenth, kiddies. Have a nice yeah. night." <laughs> <laughs> it would be so weird. Now, the, the, obviously, he wasn't a silent killer in the first one. He did yell things as he killed people, so it's not weird that he says things. But he yeah. was so you, you know, he was the quiet serial killer this whole movie. And he was, like, walking around like he was a zombie to just, like, had the... Like, he remembered how to stab people and that was it. But he's walking around all <laughs> kind of robotically. And then here, he's... He, that drops and he sort of smirks and says, and a happy new year. Like, he's, you know... Like, I would love to know why they chose this, like, little weird thing at the end. Like, what, what inspired this moment? You know? <laughs> well, uh... Yeah, I mean, uh, maybe someday uh, they'll have a documentary. <laughs> I doubt it. No one's, no one's making documentaries watch. about Sonic Deadly Day 3 time. <laughs> you never know. You never know. <laughs> like, I think it would be less weird if it was Santa. Like, see if there was just, like, a generic Santa who said, and a happy new year, everyone. Like, at least that, yeah. I would be like, okay, that feels, like, totally really weird at the end of this, but at least 
I get them just doing like a generic Christmassy kind of message at the end and like but having the killer in a tux who didn't speak the whole movie say it just is so weird or like you know it would even make more sense like if you like cut to him in the back of an ambulance and he just kind of mutters it like under his breath or oh, something sure, like yeah, yeah. you know uh, like that would be plausible or even if it was like technically like a break in the fourth wall <laughs> thing where it was just the actor and he's like on the set and he's just, uh, so, you know, that would make more sense to me because it's like, ah, who gives a shit? It's just a dumb horror movie. Let's just have the actor say have a happy new year at the end. But no, like all the, the, the specific, specific, the very specific choice they make with this ending is so strange uh, that it does make your, your, your synapses fire a little bit. Um, yeah. If, if only you could see my brain through a dome, uh, you would see what this is doing to it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh... You know, I feel like, you know, we have so many Christmas horror movies and so little New Year horror movies. I feel like we should kind of, mm. like, reclaim this movie as a New Year's <laughs> horror movie. Um, uh, Maybe there'll be more at some point. I don't know. There's not there's not a lot of New Year's. I mean, obviously, we have New Year's Evil. And then, yeah. like, we tried to do another, like, New Year's movie, like, the following year after we did that. And we found, like, some weird, obscure thing. And it was so, like dull and shit <laughs> it was like okay we don't, have, we don't have to force this if there's not actual movies to watch um that said though if there is any good new year's horror movies that you would like to recommend then please do uh but please. yeah uh, but I, I certainly don't know what know of many so i mean i guess that's selling it deadline 83 there's not a, a whole hmm. lot to the, the the back half of it really but um it's it definitely has its charms and its weird decisions uh even before the end the, the entire opening is set up in the premise of the movie is kind of wild and there's all these little weird character lines but even the, the weird character lines kind of fade out after the halfway point you know it kind of becomes yeah. a bit more just dull um it's not a painful watch it just it just feels like it goes from feeling like a weird horror sequel to what it is which is a directed video sequel uh, mm -hmm. in the back half and so I'd sort of like be aware of that, but I would, st I would still say it's worth watching just to see how weird it is. Oh, absolutely, yeah, and you know, uh, I think it's pretty easy to find right now because I'm I'm pretty sure all the sequels are on Tubi. I think at least this one's on Shutter. I'm not sure if they're all on Shutter, but I mean they're pretty easy to track down. If yeah, I think seen uh, Lionsgate kind of like own them all or now. So mm -hmm. I, maybe not all of them, but they own three, four, and five. So I, I think uh they're you know I, I i think they were all in stars at one point uh as well so yeah they're, they're probably fairly findable um you know so it's not a good movie but it's definitely an interesting one you know for, as far yeah. as these types of sequels to go these cheap sequels that no one really talks about you know i'll, I'll take this over <laughs> most of the hellraiser sequels out of <laughs> yeah i mean honestly in terms of like you know uh like you know long-running horror franchises like um, yeah, I mean, this one would beat out a lot of <laughs> other ones for me. Yeah, I'd definitely take it over, you know, most Hellraiser sequels. Um, probably a, you know, good handful of, like, Halloween sequels. Uh, yeah, I mean, we don't really like the Saw franchise, but, I mean, yeah, I'd easily take it over, like, you only like, Saw movies. Um, yeah, yeah I mean, <laughs> obviously this has nothing on the good Halloween sequels, but, yeah, the the, the bad right, ones, right, right. you know, like, yeah, there's, there's, there's definitely some arguments to to make like cer certainly i think if you're comparing this to like halloween resurrection yeah you've, you've got a bit of a fight like because do you yeah. like the stupidity of halloween resurrection or do you like the weirdness of this more but because both of them are mm -hmm. not good but mm -hmm. yeah they have something to offer yeah. <laughs> <laughs> as poor as they may be um i mean but yeah, here you go that's a uh, sad Deadly Light part three i guess it's time to rate the movie tim what are mm -hmm. you giving Saturday Night Deadly Night 3, better watch out. Um, yeah, it's, uh, you know, uh, it's kind of funny. I, I'm just wondering now, uh, obviously better watch out, you know, as a, you know, as a, has its ties to a uh, Christmas, but, uh, I wonder if it's, if it's also a pun because of, you know, the, the main character is blind. Um, <laughs> very, very yeah. good, very good. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think this one is a little tough to rate because, uh, you know, I, again, you know, it, it is a very mixed bag where, you know, obviously, the, you know, we're not talking about like high art or, or, or anything here, but, uh, you know, in terms of like, you know, horror franchise sequels, especially, you know, ones that are like gimmicky, like, you know, this franchise, obviously, you know, Evil Santa Christmas gimmick. Um, 
you know, it, it, I think it does actually stand out. It is fairly interesting and, and watchable. And um, yeah, I, you know, it, it it's kind of surprising because it would have been very easy to just have a, a franchise where just every movie, a guy dresses in a Santa costume and kills people. And in some ways that could be entertaining. Uh, but it, you know, they actually did like try <laughs> for like some really different things uh, in these movies. I mean, even the second one, which, you know, obviously half of it <laughs> is the first movie. But once you get away from that, it is like, you know, uh, <laughs> like doing some pretty weird, <laughs> like out there stuff. Uh, and yeah, I, I do appreciate the, the swings that it takes. Um, but then, yeah, for me, it's such a dip in like in quality and, and entertainment value when you get to about that halfway mark or, or so uh when it does just kind of become a slog and everything just feels yeah more low energy low effort um and i, I could very easily forgive a lot of it if you know if it, they were still having like you know interesting kills or something like that that i i could get behind but um yeah unfortunately it's just uh yeah such such a big dip uh so uh, I think I'm going to go with a 5.5. Um, yeah, uh, I mean, which I think it's still like a pretty good score, you know, considering, you know, this is the you know, straight to video, uh, you know, Silent Night, Deadly Night sequel. But um, yeah, it, it's just a shame that we have a really, really, you know, interesting kind of crazy <laughs> opening with uh, some big ideas. And then it just falls into, yeah, just kind of a, a slow slog, uh, in my opinion. But like you said, there's some little pick me ups here and there with, you know, some weird lines or like weird horniness that, yeah, kind of is entertaining for a bit, but then yeah, it slows back down. But uh, yeah, that last like five seconds though, <laughs> I do agree. Uh, that th that is uh, quite a treat. At least uh, it leaves you like <laughs> with like, kind of a like <laughs> happy. <laughs> what the hell did I just watch? <laughs> kind of feeling. Yeah, it definitely feels like they weren't taking themselves too seriously, <laughs> at the very least. Sure. Um, um, I this is this is a weird one to rate because I think I have to go lower than that. I think objectively, mm. I have to be critical of its faults and its pacing issues, and mm. that it's done. Even some of the things I like aren't necessarily good. I just I'm entertained by the the wackiness of, that it's doing. So I think I have to go with like a four, but it's it it it's it's a it's like. A very interesting and at times so bad it's good for is, is you know w where i'm classing it so i uh, you know i i would uh I, I would recommend it to a certain sect of horror fan who likes mm. checking out weird like shitty sequels to things <laughs> or you know, at, but, you know at times genuinely interesting so yeah. uh, but there you go that is uh that is selling it did like part three uh we're not doing part four or part five this year we'll be back next year with uh, your part four uh we have another christmas release planned uh in the coming weeks uh we also have a, a guest top 10 with some collaborators doing some christmasy mm. themed things so uh look forward to that uh but of course um you can let us know what you thought of selling did late part three if you've seen it in the comments uh however many dozen there are of you <laughs> please uh let us know uh but of course you can like subscribe ding the bell for notifications all those things do help us out a lot and of course you can go over to patreon.com slash tv and support us over there on a monthly basis and get bonus episodes and things like that and not only for screams after midnight but for the other movie shows that we do on mail movies as well as some other stuff too so uh you know, please uh do uh, and obviously enjoy your month of Christmas, enjoy the holidays and all that stuff. Uh, but uh, hopefully you enjoyed our thoughts on Silent Deadly Night Part 3. But uh, that is us. So thank you once again for watching or listening. We always appreciate it. Keep watching scary movies. Have a Merry Christmas and we'll see you next time. <laughs>